Father Moss coming to you by a uh, via uh, Skype or something. I don't know where I'm where I'm coming from, uh, but anyway, I'm at Prairie's Chapel. We're going to do another service, and this one is for Palm Sunday. Uh, Palm Sunday is a very uh, memorable event in most people's lives. We have, were going to church very young. You remember the palms uh, being uh, given out on on the masses, mostly on Sunday in those days. And so how many Palm Sundays have I had? Well, I'm, I'm 68, I've started going almost as a toddler. So I would think I've probably been uh, involved in 65 or 66 Palm Sundays in my life. And we have, I wonder how many Tippy's gone to, probably a lot more than that. But uh, the first reading that we'll have is from the Phil Philippians and um, it it's really suits this Sunday very well. It, a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Jesus Christ, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped at. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Coming in human likeness and found human in appearance, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. That is the name of Jesus, and at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend, and those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. The word of the Lord. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? All who see me scoff at me, they mock me and shame. Gospel. Well, as you know, uh, on Palm Sunday they read the entire Passion, but I'm not going to read the entire Passion because we'll be here until the cows come home, come or until Jesus comes again in glory. So I'm just going to read a small snippet of it, which I think is uh, goes to the, uh, the the heart of the matter. And it, it says here, it was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon because of an eclipse of the sun. Then the veil of the temple was torn in the middle, and Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And when he had said this, he breathed his last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Father's will, accepting his death, death on a tree. Jesus, 
the Sunday is also the, the opening of or the beginning of Holy Week, which is the most important week in the history of the, the church in the liturgi liturgical year as well. And um, uh, it's the most important week in salvation history as well. And, and so, you know, after Palm Sunday, then we celebrate uh, Holy Thursday, in which we commemorate the giving of the Holy Eucharist to us. And remember that mass, we, we have a mass and then we, we have the washing of the feet, which is uh, follows in John's gospel of the washing of the feet. And then we have the, the um, uh, communion um, uh, as well. And at that then we, re we put away the uh, communion in the tabernacle and take everything off the altar to prepare for a Good Friday. And then on Good Friday, we, we celebrate uh, uh, the reading of the Passion again. That's another version from a different gospel. And then we have the uh, adoration of the, the cross or reverencing of the cross, if you remember. And then uh, finally, we have a communion service where we bring in the Eucharist and distribute the Eucharist and then we fold up everything on the altar and it, it, it's all one service. We don't even have a final prayer. And then we, we meet again on Easter Vigil and at that Mass then we have uh, the reading of the Exultat and uh, also then uh, many, many readings. And, and then the Mass then uh, celebrates uh, are bringing new Christians into the church and to be baptized into the church for the first time. And then we renew our uh, baptismal promises. And then the next day on Easter Sunday, then it's a regular mass, but we renew our baptismal, baptismal promises at that mass as well. So that's Easter week. And unfortunately, we're not gonna have Easter week this, this year. And that's why I elaborated a little bit, just kind of remembered a little bit. Uh, but you know, if somebody from outer space would come to a, a Christian church, and especially a Catholic church, uh, what they would see is, is a cross hanging uh, there with a man hanging on the cross. And if you think about it, that's really, really weird uh, that our main, main symbol, our icon in the church is uh, the crucified Lord, a crucifix. And um, it would be like, uh, having a, a, a criminal hanging from a noose uh, from the rafters, you know? And that's really what it was. A, a executed, who was thought of as a, as a criminal. Of course he wasn't, but he was executed as a criminal. And, um, and so that whole uh, process of being, you know, in the early Christian church, uh, it was Catholic at that time, there was, there was no, icon of uh, the crucifixion for 400 years. You do never found a depiction of, of, of a crucified Lord. And the reason for that, it was considered so painful and so horrible that they just didn't want to depict it. They'd rather depict a risen Lord instead. And so it was horrible. And so when Jesus was arrested and then tried unfairly, he was tried, uh, at, and at his trial, uh, all kinds of lies were said about him, and then he was scourged. And to be scourged was a horrible thing. You know, uh, uh, they, they usually had two people doing the scourging, and they had this whip, a scourge. A whip was like a cat of nine tails, had a lot of thongs on it. And the thongs had hooks on the end, and they took a real strong man to scourge, 
because they would lay on the whip and the lashes would wrap around the body and dig into the flesh. And so it didn't take so much strength to lay it on, it was to pull it away. Because they, when they pulled it away, those hooks would dig into the, the flesh and, and tear the flesh all up. And so Jesus was literally uh, bathed in blood. He was standing in a pool of blood. And of course that weakened him a great deal. Terribly, terribly painful. And on top of that, then they put a crown. Now, most people who were scourged, the Romans, the Romans had a law that you could scourge uh, 39 minus one because it was considered 40 lashes would kill a man. It was so bad. And even if it didn't kill him at the time, they would probably die of an infection anyway because the skin was so torn up. And so they put the crown of thorns on him. And these were these big, long, hard, and very sharp thorns that they made actually kind of a cap out of it. It wasn't really a crown, but a whole cap. And they take rods and pound on it and drive those thorns into his scalp and into his, into his uh, uh, skull. And as, if we could believe the, the Shroud of Turin, they actually one thorn pierced over the eyebrow and right through the skull into his eye. Can you imagine how painful that is and how horrible it was? And after that, then he had to carry that cross beam. Some people think they carried the whole cross. Most scholars say most crucifixions, they carried the cross beam, but it was up the hill. After being scourged and, and still wearing that crown of thorns, he had to carry that heavy beam, you know, and, and every step took a huge effort and he could be thrown off balance at any moment because, you know, that's a pretty heavy load to carry. And then they took it away from him at the top of the hill and affixed it to the horizontal beam and then laid him on the cross and they put nails through his wrist. And it wasn't the hands at wrist because that's the only way that other, if it was through the hand, it would pull away. But through the wrist, it would stay in place. And they raised him up and dropped that cross into a, a hole to keep it upright with a t terrific thud. And if you've ever, I uh, hit your, um, what they call your crazy bone, you know, and it feels like electricity going through your body. Well, that same nerve is the one that goes through the wrist into the hand. So the hands were constricted into fists, but that electrical, terrible, terrible, agonizing pain, uh, just shooting through his body. And then the worst part of crucifixion, he'd have to pull himself off, up in, in order to breathe because otherwise he'd be asphyxiated. And so the natural response to being smothered is to pull up to get a breath. But when he pulled up, it was terribly painful. Then he re relaxed, so the, relieved the pain, and then he couldn't breathe again. So for three hours, Jesus struggled on the cross to be able to breathe. And finally, relief came because he said, as we read in this, this passage, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit and he died, he breathed his last. And that was merciful uh, for him because it was a horrible, horrible way to die. And so we take this, this cross and this, this figure of somebody who agonizedly gave his life for us, and that's the center, center of our attention when we go into mass is to see this. And, but what does it mean to us? Well, it means how much God loves us, that he would go through all of this in order to show us mercy, uh, to forgive us our sins, and also to just absolutely love us uh, infinitely. And so that's what the cross stands for, is not the pain, uh, it, you know, we recognize the pain, uh, but it's that God loves us so much. And so when we look at a cross, and the Pope just yesterday uh, gave a speech at his daily mass, where there are no people, because they're avoiding the the uh, coronavirus in the Vatican as well. He said, a good meditation is take your crucifix and meditate on it because uh, the what put him on the cross are the sins of the world. So we can med meditate on our sins that crucified Jesus, but we can also um, meditate on God's mercy to us, even though we're sinners and his profound lo love for us that will be followed by the cross is always followed by the resurrection. So there's a lot of hope for us. 
And so I'm not eager to die, but at my age, they tell me I'm a, in a critical age period, so I'm being careful not to catch the, the virus. Now, how do you do that? You can't see them, so you can't run away from them. You could just sequester ourselves as best we can and hope for the best, I think. But I, I went out this morning and my neighborhood was weird because all the cars were parked there and there wasn't anybody out at all. Everybody was at home. And I haven't seen that in my entire life to see how people are all hunkering down. And it's a good thing. So we're hoping that we flatten the curve and the, the damage done uh, can be minimized and such. But still we pray for the elderly and the vulnerable because we may lose some of them. And actually, I have to say, I might be one of them because I'm, I'm approaching 80. So I ask for your prayers for my protection. And especially since I'm the one who has to go up to the hospital and anoint people when they do get the virus. So I'm going to have to expose myself uh, more, uh, more uh, readily than most people will. And so I have to be very careful as well uh, to be completely hazmat protected and uh, but when the call comes i have to go and so pray for me and i'll pray for you i do do daily masses i don't do it every day but when i do have a daily mass i do uh, it's for your for your intentions so thank you for listening may god bless you